Okay, so here we're going to look at the actual contents in a GTSPP data file. And this is true. We'll be looking at the ASCII form just because it's convenient. But in fact, the, the identical content also occurs within the NetCDF files. Uh, so all of the same information is carried slightly. It's a different kind of presentation, but it's still the same information. Um, and so there's this session and then another one to help explain how all this stuff works. So first of all, as I said, the, the original format as developed in Canada was in binary. And of course, binaries between one computer and another computer look different because of the way they order bits and bytes. And uh, it's possible to read them from different computers, but you have to get into more details of, of how to do that. And so the US NODC developed an ASCII, a translator that would go from a binary to an ASCII form. So that's just the character strings, right? And uh, so it just reproduces everything in this character string. And the uh, format itself, as I explained, makes use of a number of different mm -hmm. kinds of coding tables to uh, formalize and uh, make, the, uh, make the information content more rigorous than just free strings where, oh, well, I collected these data on, you know, in such and such a ship and I was seasick at the time, so I'm not sure. It's hard to do retrievals or anything on uncontrolled free text fields, so we chose to make a lot of different code tables to describe it, and you'll see some examples. Um, there's also, because we were uh, wanting to know who who in the GTSPP organization of the partners, who did what to the data and when. We built what we call a processing history part of the record. And in this, there's uh, everybody who deals with a file can write a record that says trans what software package, what application did the uh, data file go through, on what date, were there any changes, and record all that stuff. So we can actually, it's like an audit trail of the processing stream. And at first, this sounds like, why would you ever do it? It's a lot of extra baggage to carry around. But in fact, more than once, it's helped resolve when problems come up in processing. You can look through the history record, and sometimes you can tell why it happened. So for instance, in Canada, we found that for one reason or another, don't remember the why, but a, a group of stations didn't go through a particular process, but when it should have. And we were able to tell because that part, that record, was not present in the history. So it's, it's, it serves two purposes. One is this audit trail of all the software that the records will go through. And the second one that you'll see, uh, perhaps an example of, is if there is a change made in the record, we want it to keep the original value that as it came, but if we could, <coughs> excuse me, if we could make a correction, we would put the corrected version up in the data part of the file, and the original value we stored in the history. So if you needed to get it, it was in the record. Um, call sign tables, ship platform names, data types, you'll see there's a, a variety of uh, kinds of ta uh, tables. So there are two kinds of records in the uh, GTSPP format. There's one that's called the station record and another set of uh, that record profile information. So the station record, as you'll see, is ship name, date, time, lat long, um, lots of information about what was recorded there. If there are surface measurements of, say, uh, clouds or uh, uh, air pressure or things like that, it appears in the station record. All of that extra baggage, the history part, is in the station record. Profile record, in fact, contains just the individual profiles. And they're organized so that a profile in the profile record is a depth or pressure and the, a temperature or a salinity. So you'll get a profile record for the temperature profile, another one for the salinity profile. And 
there may be a different suite of depths on those because for one reason or another maybe a sensor failed so you may get uh, let's say 200 salinities in a profile and 350 temperatures and so the record structure allows this variable length to the records the record was constructed again it was in the old days where we had a limit on the total length of the record that we were storing in binary and so we had to make um, arbitrary decisions of how many repeats of these records in each one of these little groups we could choose. Um, and so that puts some limitations. That's one of the weaknesses that we have in the current, uh, in current technology terms. You don't have to do that anymore. And the net CDF profile or net CDF data structure doesn't have those kinds of limitations. It has other ones, but it doesn't have those. So you'll see examples of what that looks like. So here's a dump. A complete an ASCII dump of what the record looks like and it looks pretty horrible um, and you saw the uh, version that um, Charles showed early on that had so for up here this first record here is the uh, this M key this master key and it's the essentially the first six characters represent the uh, first six characters to the one here represents a crew or a, a station identifier and the last two characters represent uh, profile records. So a profile record if you see here the 0100 that's a station record and all of this information here all of this stuff down to this endpoint here is the station record and then the profile record starts here so it's 01 and it's 01 is the first profile record here you see 02 is the next profile and so on, and you can see it's broken up into six, seven, eight, nine, and so on. Again, because of the um, the uh, limitations we had in the computer systems we were using those days, we could only put 1,500 unique uh, observations in a particular profile record. So if we have a, a full profile that goes down to uh, 5,000 meters, for example, we would have one, two, three, four, so five, five segments, as we call them, broken up into these little pieces. So it would be zero, one, two, three, four, five, and the type of the variable. If you look in the record, we'll we'll take this apart a little bit later. But so this is D O X Y. So this is an oxygen profile. Uh, P cell. That's a salinity profile. Uh, T E M P is a temperature profile. So again, those are. A, there's a set of code tables that tells you what the profile type is. So that's what it looks like. And station record, profile records here. So let's look at it. So the first component is uh, talks the station location, time, and some other information. Do I have a record? Yes, here we are here. So. Um, see if I can remember what all this stuff is. This is a, yeah, uh, let's see. So this is the a one degree square. So we had a way of encoding quickly into this format here what the one degree square is that the data come from. And we did that because we needed to do it. We wanted to have an easy sort on the record. So you just have to look at the first part of the record and you could do sorts by area or by time or by this or by that. And so really, the lat long information is encoded in here, um, but you don't have to worry about it. Up to here, this first six characters. The next thing is the. Yes. Okay, I'm going to show you where to get later. So if you can come, listen to Papa say and compare to what you see on screen or your, your PC. Yeah, the, the user manual will be a good place to look. Yeah. I haven't looked at this for four or five years anyway. And I make out the slide. So so the top portion just the actual data form a look back. And the lower portion of the, the slide, the number indicate uh, this one will be the main key and the number in the, in the presence is the starting point. That's right. So the first eight characters is uh, is M key. The next um, 
Starting nine, will be Starting nine, nine, nine and his six characters is the one degree square. The next one is the cruise identifier. In this case, we're starting with 18, which is a, an international country code for Canada. And the, the uh, D01030 is the platform identifier. Again, there's a table of these things. Yes. Some of them are, uh, are uh, real-time call signs. Some of them are um, ship IDs and so on. So anyway, these are this without going through too much, but this is the kind of information that's in it. So cruise ID, then year, then month, then day, then time as hour, hour, minute, minute. Uh, that's uh, oh in here somewhere. Um, data type. So um, we're in here. We'll encode how the data, what the data look like, and uh, where do I see it? Uh, CD, this little, this, this, uh, these group here, that means it's a CTD, uh, a CTD, and the data collected on the, on the, when it's being lowered, D for down. Sometimes people collect data in a CTD going up. And the CTD sensors are at the bottom of a, or the sensors, the, the conductivity cell and thermistor are at the bottom of the CTD. And so when you're pulling it up, you're mixing the water through the water column. So some people will say, oh, no, that's not good to do. You should always measure on the downcast because the, the sensors are at the bottom end of the probe. So we want it to record whether it's an up or down. So that's what the uh, uh, data type is about. This unique message number is just um, stuff to be carried around in the, uh, in the format for purposes of sorting and things like that. You don't have to worry about it at all. Uh, stream source. This was a information about how the data reached us in the GTSPP program. So it would tell us whether it came from the WMO system or whether it came through a delayed mode system, and we would be able to tell, you know, what uh, essentially where the data come from, so that you can diff tell whether it's a real-time, a delayed mode, did it come from scripts, did it come from uh, Woods Hole, did it come from a Canadian Institute, uh, or wherever. So it was, again, just a tracking mechanism. So if someone asked, did you get my data from such and such a place in time, we could go and use that to key on that, uh, on whether it did. Next one is a U flag. That's an update flag, and that tells between uh, our own processing in Canada and the processing in the US for example whether they should update a record that is it's a new record to go into the archive should they delete a record that's in the archive because there's a uh, there was a mistake in the old version and we want you to do another one a replace which would be a replace of an existing record in the archive or we also use the symbol skip. So if we had duplicates of data, we'd attach a little S flag to it, and the update software says, do nothing with this, just go to the next record. Uh, a station number. Station numbers on delayed mode will, the originators will provide a station number sometimes. Uh, with the real time, we would assign it on, on a particular cruise. Uh, lat long. Lat long, Q pause. Everything that's preceded by the letter Q underscore is a quality flag. So through the QC process, we would check if the position of that station looked right. And sometimes they do, most times they do, occasionally not. So for instance, a classic case, I was looking at a, prof a, a ship cruise, a real time and it was tracking from Hawaii across the equator down to Australia. And for some reason, the ship, whoever was encoding the message, forgot to add a negative sign when it crossed the equator to the latitude. So it looked like the ship bounced off the equator and was going back up north, but in fact it had crossed the equator. So we would, in that case, if we could have figured it out, we would have assigned a QPAUS of four which means it's bad data for the position 
Q date time is again a, a, a quality flag on whether the position or the date and the time are sensible. And sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't. Q record is something that we used as a quick way to assess the quality of the entire data set. So we would say look at all of the quality flags represented in the record that's on the profile or the station records and for that station what is the worst quality flag that has occurred. So if one profile a temperature at one location in a profile is flagged as bad Q record would be marked as bad so that quickly you would know if there's anything wrong in the profile. The logic was that most profiles would probably come in very clean and you would have a Q record of one meaning it's good. And, um, and mostly that was true. But anyway, so that's, that's what we used. Update flag, uh, that's just when was the record updated into the archive. So we would know if it went in today or tomorrow or 50 years ago. Bulletin time and bulletin header, these are records that are used only for the real-time data. So bulletin time is when the data were posted onto the GTS. And bulletin header was, uh, let me see if I can remember. It was, yes, what the editors, in the, in the GTS record it tells you it encodes the kind of information that's included in the bulletin. And so we, we preserve that. Again, it was for tracking data. Source ID, this is used in both real-time and delayed mode. So if we had inserted data on the GTS from Canada, our source ID here is CWOW. Uh, from Germany, it's EGRR. From the US, it's KWBC. These are just the, the MET centers that insert the data. Uh, if it's delayed mode, that would say something like um, Bedford Institute of Oceanography in Canada, or Scripps Institute in, in the US, or whatever the, the actual originators. So it tells you where the data came from. Uh, stream ident, that is... Um, Let's see if I can remember. Yes, it tells you whether it's a real-time or delayed mode profile. So you, you could distinguish the, the type of uh, real-time message that it came in or, uh, or the delayed mode data type. QC version. This was, is a field that records what version of the quality control software the data have passed through. So there's version, I don't know what version we're up to now, but so you can version the, the, uh, the, the set of tests, some of the qualifiers, and this would record that version. A data availability, this was a flag we put in. It can be uh, a variety of things, but if for some reason you have to protect data that you can't actually distribute it publicly yet, you can put a, a marker on this that says it's still private. And at some point in the future, you can switch it to a character we used A for mean available to anyone. And then we had these four counts, if you will. These are fields that says how many profile, different profile types are there, how many different um, real or integer value parameters there are, how many uh, character parameters there are in the station record, and then how many uh, history records there are. And these had certain limitations to it. And again, because the record, the, the machine we were using at the time made it, had a different way of store, I guess they still do. They still store reels, numbers, or numbers differently than character strings in computers. And so when uh, uh, a record came in that had letters in it, we had to store that in a character string. And when it was numbers, we would store it in a, a number string. So that's what the, the station record looks like. And you can see uh, some examples uh, from about here on. No, from about here on.
No, I gotta find. Anyway, I guess here, from here on, it's all history records. And you'll see what that content looks like later. So, talks about two repeats of the profile information. Um, we'll see that later on. Yeah, I talked about that. So, here's an example. So, in the, in the station record, it says, I have these many different kinds of profiles, and these are what they are. So the example we see here is there's uh, oxygen. There's some records about, tells how many different segments it's been broken into. So it says there are two segments of oxygen. So there was more than 1,500 measurements of oxygen, for example. The profile type is oxygen. A duplicate flag says N for no, it's not a duplicate uh, in the database. That record is, is the best version to get. If that were a duplicate, it would have a D attached to it. Um, a digitization code, it tells you some details about what kind of resolution there is in the, uh, on the, uh, uh, the measurements. And the standard is the same sort of thing. Deepest depth is just a way to tell you um, very quickly what the uh, how deep the profile goes so in this case it was I think it's this uh, 492 meters was the deepest depth and then here's the another profile type uh, can't remember what PLT dollar is but anyway there's a code table for that to tell you what that uh, variable means salinity temperature so that's what the profile, the, just in the station record, tells you. How many profiles to expect, how many segments there are to it, and some of the details about the, the uh, accuracy or the, the, the precision of the measurements. Um, in the surface parameter group, so this is one of those little repeat things, that it had, and this is where we can store real or integer numbers. In this case, we store the sounding depth because the sounding depth came with the data in the record when it came to us and so we record that BATH is a sounding depth and it's 2440 meters and then there's a flag that says uh, whether we believe it or not in this case it's set to 1 so we think that's a good value so we can check the sounding that comes in against an independent bathymetry file that we have to uh, five minute, there's a five minute bathymetry file, there's a two minute bathymetry file for the whole world and we can check for that station in that location do we expect it to be 2400 meters or 5000 meters and if it's too far off usually if it's within 10 percent it's close enough because if you're on a shelf region for example the depths can vary very a great deal and so you're, you have to be a little uh, uh, careful with it. But, but generally, that's, uh, you know, the bathymetry is, is pretty good. Next record, this is the surface code. So this is where we would store ASCII records of, of uh, information. And so the first thing that we see here, this ACC dollar, that's the code. And that was the flag that uh, we would use in Canada for an accessions identifier. So for us, the identifier is A2002219, I guess, whatever the length is. It's, a, it's just a way that we keep track of it. And because it's mixed with numbers, digits, and um, alphabetic characters, it goes in this surface code. Uh, let's see what else that I can pick out here. INS, INS1. For example, this part here, and then it's followed by IOS. So that's the Institute of Ocean Sciences in Canada. So this is a Canadian uh, uh, station. Um, what else? We have some other ones. Uh, the platform name is the JP Tully. That's the name of the ship. The project that it was the data were collected for is uh, from the La Perouse Bank, which is a uh, uh, one of the bathymetry features off the west coast of Canada. So that's what they all look like. And then there's these things here, QCF dollar, QCP dollar. Um, that, those are records that are used 
to record. In the case of QCP, that's the quality control tests performed. And QCF is quality control tests that were failed. So we record what did it go, what was what were the tests that were made, conducted, and which one of those tests failed. And there's a a messy, sometimes if you think of it, it's clever. Other people just think it's a horrible, messy way to do it, but it's a way to encode all of the tests, and you'll see that later. And then um, some other stuff that uh, that's part of that record. So this is a catch-all, if you will, for text strings that we need to, we wanted to keep with the data. So the reason for doing this is uh, in five years later, Institute of Ocean Sciences might have reworked the data, found some things that they uh, wanted to fix in it, sent it back to us, but didn't tell us it was a, 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 re, uh, a replacement of what we currently had in the data center. And so you, unless we could do a duplicates check that would find all these things, and sometimes we'd run it through a duplicates check, and 45 out of 50 stations, say, look like they're duplicates, but five of them aren't. And you say, well, what's going on? If you can use the institute code and the ship code and the this and the that, all of these different bits of information in, the, in this part of the record, you can sometimes easily determine, oh, this is a replacement for what we have in our archives. Get rid of what we have and replace it with this. So that's the reason to track all this information. Um, surface code. So this is an explanation of of and some examples of what they are. And so here's what the code looks like, and I gave you some examples of that already. So the accession number for Canada. Uh, there's a second accession number for a different process. Uh, CSC. That's the name of the chief scientist on the cruise. So we would keep that if if it comes to us. Um, this is the call sign of the ship. So if it comes in delayed mode, but they tell us that the ship is a call sign and what it is, in this case it's the uh, CG2958. So when it's reporting in real time, that's the identifier that comes with it. But the name of the ship is the Tully. So we keep both of those. And there's some other stuff. The instrument type is a Seabird uh, CTD. Uh, 911. Keep that information. If it were an XBT, we would say it was a T7 probe or a T9 or a, a T6, whatever. We would keep that. QCF, QCP, I just want you to have a look at that. What you see here is some uh, eight characters. Looks like gobbledygook. That is an encoding of the tests that were performed and failed in hexadecimal. Hexadecimal is base 16. The reason we did that was to conserve space, uh, and you'll see something about that later. Here we are. So this is what a QCP looks like this. So you'll see 41E1FFDE. So digits 0 through 9 are the same in hexadecimal. It's 0 through 9. Uh, 10 is A, 11 is B, and so on. F is 15. And so the binary, essentially what that, that uh, binary look is, it's a 32-bit field, and you put a flag, you set a 1 for every test that's performed. That's really what all it is, is simply set a little flag of a 1. And then when you convert it to hexadecimal, you're converting 4 bits at a time. So 1110 converts to an E. So that's the number 1110 is the number 14 in binary and that's an E. The next number 1101 that's a D and so you see E, D, F, F so you count from the right hand side to the left hand side because that's how the bits are ordered in a computer word. Okay, Messy stuff and then so on. So F is uh, 15, that's 1111, and so on. And then QCF, this records what test failed, and you can see it was the test number 7 in the record. 
and test number seven will be is identified in a set of tables. So that's how you interpret these. It's a little awkward to unwind it sometimes, but once you get the hang of it, it's uh, it's uh, it's pretty easy. And in the binary form, of course, uh, you don't have to to include, you don't have to write it this way. But when you're delivering out to somebody else, you want to deliver an ASCII component, and that's how it was done. Um, history. This is the history record. This is where we record what processes. The, the record went through and if there are any changes to it. So the first part of it, uh, two characters, says who did what. It's, or sorry, it's an identifier code. And so it's uh, ME. So ME stood for MEDS, which was the name of the, the previous name of the organization I worked for. They've changed their names, but we'll leave the, that, uh, that uh, code to stand for, for MEDS. And then processing code. Uh, so that's uh, C Q C A D. So that means it's a quality control uh, software. And then it gives a version number of 1.0. And then the next is the processing date. So when what did it go through the QC? It was in 2002, in August 9th. What action was taken from that? And in this case, all it did was we're just recording that it went through the record. So we write um, QC and then RCRD. Just say the record passed through this piece of software. That was all. <clears throat> the action, action code, action parameter, auxiliary ID, ID and previous value those are all there to be able to record changes that took place in the data stream. So the original data would end up here if we had actually changed the records. I don't know that there's any here. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter. If, if there were changes, they would be in this part of the record. And what you'll notice You'll see ME, ME, and so on, ME. IGO3 is a format converter that would go through. So in Canada, we would put it, every piece of software that it went through, we would write a record saying it went through this. So a format converter, and so on and so on. Uh, OCUP, that's the update software. So that tells us on, uh, in, on August 9th in 2002, it went through the update program into the into the archive. NO, that's the US NODC, so they added a record for uh, what they did, and this is their little code to their code to say what process it went through at their end, and so on through this record. And you can see the last record that is a, a process that took place at NODC. So again, it was just it's an audit trail to keep track of where the, how the record has been processed. And uh, although it looks painful to do, it turns out to be a valuable thing for a data center. OK, into the profile record. So the initial part of a profile record is just location, time, uh, pro and profile uh, identifiers. Okay, we'll just go through here. So again, this is this M key here, and 01 means it's the first segment of a profile, uh, some ship identifier, so uh, where is it? One degree square, ship identifier stuff, uh, 2001, uh, month 10, day 6, uh, at 426, it's a CTD record. And so that's the just the first part of the profile record. And then we have, here's uh, the oxygen uh, profile, segment one. Some values here. It says it came in with uh, the independent variable was pressure, not depth. So it was reported to us in pressures. And the pressure was uh, 7.31 decibars. 
7.31 decibars, and the oxygen value was uh, 1193.304, I guess. Um, milliliters per liter, perhaps? I don't know. Whatever the unit is. And then the uh, quality flag attached to... Oh, sorry. It was... One is the quality flag on the pressure, and then the uh, oxygen value is 193.304, and then the quality flag in this case is 4, so we had doubts that that was a, a sensible oxygen. Then the next, pr uh, next pressure value, next pressure value, next pressure value, and so on, repeats down, and so there were 1,500 of those. The next record would be the second part of the oxygen record, picks up where that one left off, so it would have been uh, 1193, that's right. The quality flag is, one, is the one is here, and 1193 is 304. So it looks like 1193.304 um, was a common value for the, the oxygen in this profile. So it looked like it was all the same value all the way down from top to bottom, and that's why we thought this doesn't look right. Yeah, oxygen doesn't isn't uniform from top to bottom, and so that's why it was flagged as four. And so there's more and more of those, and then we get to the next kind, which is the salinity. Uh, it picks up again at the second uh, segment, and there were only two segments: of salinity, and then the uh, the temperature, first segment, second segment, so on. Again. Both came in with pressure as the independent variable. Um, the, um, the pressure was uh, 7.3 decibars. That looked OK. Um, the temperature was 14.532 degrees C. That looked OK, and so on. So that's what the pressure record looks like. I don't know if I click this, whether it would work. Oh, sorry, I got to. We'll do this just for fun. Oh, it doesn't matter. Uh, so there's software that Charles, I guess, has written, or somebody at NODC wrote, to pull out all this stuff from uh, GTSPP. And I should let you explain this part. So I know there's lots of information in there. The user manual that Charles talked about, that's the thing to look at in more detail. The code tables that describe what the content is for those different fields, not all of those are available at the moment from the US NODC website. But if you go to the Canadian site, and I, um, I'll have to give you the URL for that, but if you go to the Canadian site, it has all the code tables there that describes what, what all the codes that are used within GTSPP. Okay. Before I go further, I'd like to show you a couple of things. The first one, open your browser and go to GTPP website. Okay. So this is GTP website. After that, you type, enter training. Okay. All the content, all the training is on that website. Okay. We will replace the GTP website at NODC, as you see right now, by this website. All the web page, the old GDPP web page will be replaced or update. Okay, I hope before the end of this calendar year. But right now, the training website at the end of DC GDPP web page is just designed for this class. Will stay there for another maybe one or two months. Okay, and I will remove that or after I update the DC GDP website. Okay, but I will remain put the GDP training for a while. 
So you go to GTAPP training website, and there's a code table, okay, which is not exact right now at the normal web page, but should be there. So all the information, okay. And this is a much user friendly because it provides a lot of interaction or interactive tool allow users to navigate through the web page. Okay. Now under the data site, there are another link will take you to they say would supposedly should take you to NODC user defined data set website. But below there there's a GTPB GTSPB data user menu which is in PDF file. You can click on that one. Okay. So this is the old the version one that we make available through IODE uh, publication system. Okay. There's a version two which could start in draft. I didn't make that available on the public for public use, but should be available under the IODE, the internal IOD training uh, directory. Okay, got to be, it's not there, I will double check, make sure. The, the update version of oh, this one is available. Okay, but so right now, just for, for your information only, there's a PDF file for the first version, which we make available in 2011. Okay, so uh, I don't want to go to detail on this website for now. This just provide you with background information. You know, if you, you will, anytime you have a problem or question about the training, and you can go there and get the information you you need. Okay.